Hello everyone and welcome. Today we'll be looking at reviews and their uses. I'll just um, make sure that I'm sharing the right slide with you. Okay. All's good. All right, so yes, uh, today we'll be looking at reviews and their uses where we'll be looking at various types of reviews. Um, so yes, uh, we'll be looking at uh, various types of reviews, but we'll be particularly focusing on systematic reviews and understanding uh, the basics of the very, very basics of meta-analysis and uh, tips to quick article screening that has been covered earlier in your tutorial. So that is just because it is an integral part of a systematic review is why I have mentioned over here, but we have covered that in detail in the earlier tutorial. So yes, uh, what are the uh, real life applications for what you're doing um, today and you'll be learning today? So this is extremely important for you to identify um, when you're reading various research articles, which type of review are you reading? Is this systematic, narrative, scoping, so on and so forth? And undertaking a systematic review is a very, very important skill as an epidemiologist and as a researcher, uh, which cannot be undermined. And yes, um, therefore you are, today you'll be having a detailed overview about how uh, one would go about undertaking a systematic review. So yes, uh, this is a skill set which um, say early career um, students and graduate, they would be writing it in their CV that they know how to undertake systematic review. So this is an important skill set to learn. Um, and so yes, this has direct implications for your careers if um, at all you are going in the space of research. All right, and please do understand when I say you're going in the space of research, uh, this is what happens in the nutrition field, and I speak about the nutrition field, that a lot of jobs in nutrition are coming up where they want a multidisciplinary, um, yes, multidisciplinary skill set where you're not just proficient in your dietetic skills, but you have research skills as well. So for instance, you are a clinical dietitian um, and a research coordinator, or else you are a clinical research dietitian. These are the type of positions which are coming up. So yes, uh, alongside your clinical skills, if you do have research skills, this is a value added X factor and the probability of you being chosen for a position would be much more higher in comparison to someone else, which is demanding both facets of um, say the uh, uh, role position, which is clinical facet and the research facet. So yes, I'm not sure if this is applicable to uh, various other health faculties such as nursing, physio occupational, but this is certainly what is being seen in the last five years, especially in the area of nutrition and dietetics, where you need multiple skill sets. And therefore undertaking a systematic review is a very valuable skill set to add in your CVs. If you know how to do it, and if you have done it as part of a research project, then that is fantastic. It's cherry on cake. All right, so I hope this makes sense as to why you are learning this and what are its application and practice. So yes, these are your pre-readings. Um, again, simple YouTube videos, please do, do go through them. And yeah, so um, going on to other uh, type of reviews. So yes, uh, first, just a brief distinction, which you all have and now are very aware of, which is you have um, one set, which is called as the original articles, which are your cross-sectional studies, longitudinal RCTs, case control, so on and so forth, all right? Whereas reviews, they are not doing an original study. It is basically summarizing the existing literature, all right? So you're not doing your own original study. You're looking at what others have done and you're summarizing this literature. This summarization of literature can be in various forms and this summarization of literature is called as reviews. So the summarization of literature can be in the form of narrative review, scoping review, systematic review and meta-analysis. All right. And as I said, the main focus today is going to be on meta analysis. All right. So I hope this makes sense that reviews are not original article. They are basically in simple terms, summarization of what others have done, other researchers have done. So other publications. Okay. And this you have gone through again in detail in um, earlier lectures is your NHMRC level of evidence. So if you see the level one evidence, it is a systematic review slash meta-analysis 
uh, of all relevant randomized control trial for the research question that you're investigating. So yes, if you have a systematic review of randomized control trial, this is considered the top level of evidence. So for you to know and learn how to do a systematic review and a meta-analysis in the future are excellent key sets and skills which I cannot emphasize enough for a student to have, all right? Especially if the student is considering dual positions, uh, which are um, say upcoming in the market, research plus clinical skills. All right, so yes, our focus is systematic review, uh, but please do understand meta-analysis is again, a very complex statistical approach, uh, which is undertaken. We are just going to have a very brief snapshot of what is meta-analysis. But this requires a three lecture series in itself to understand what is and how do you undertake a meta-analysis, which of course is not part of um, the scope of this um, say unit, because um, this generally is a uh, meta-analysis would generally be uh, discussed in depth for a unit which is um, biostatistical in nature, all right? So which is a, a amalgamation of epidemiology and biostatistics. All right, so yes, this is what I wanted to emphasize that the skill which you're learning today, a systematic review, is the top level evidence. If you know how to do a systematic review, meaning you are um, aiming to generate top level evidence. All right, of course, uh, uh, systematic reviews of RCTs are the cream evidence, but you can also do systematic reviews of various other study designs, such as cross-sectional, prospective cohort case control, so on and so forth. All right, they will not be level one evidence, but they will be really good quality evidence to refer to, all right? So yes, they will not be classified as level one, but it is still considered good quality evidence where you're summarizing what has been done in um, the various prospective cohort studies related to your research question, all right? So yes, now the three main types of reviews which are most commonly found in health research is narrative, scoping, and systematic. Um, so in narrative um, and scoping, the most common thing you will see is that critical appraisal of the type of original article which is there in terms of study design, statistical analysis, methodological approaches is not particularly the focus. Whereas this is very opposite from a systematic review. In a systematic review, uh, the focus is a lot on critical appraisal and review of the literature, all right? So you're critiquing the study design, the methodological approaches, the quality of the study, uh, the bias which may be affiliated to it, all right? And there may be minor statistical analysis involved as well. What type of minor statistical analysis? We will look at that, all right? They are not mandatory, but yes, um, they are encouraged. So yes, you have very minor statistical analysis to do in a systematic review. So this is the distinct stark um, difference between say scoping narrative reviews and systematic review, which is critical appraisal, the critique, the rig rigor and the robustness which is involved in say, uh, fine tuning the articles and reviewing the articles is what is done in a systematic review versus the other two. All right, so um, yes, narrative review is a bit more specific than a scoping review that is there. And narrative review, it summarizes, um, say, um, some, uh, say the existing evidence, but it is more of a summary of evidence rather than critique of an evidence, all right? So that is what a narrative review entrails. Whereas in a scoping review, uh, yes, you're gathering all evidence, but this evidence may also include gray literature. Gray literature could be such as say, um, PhD thesis, which are out there or unpublished data, which is out there. All right, um, and then uh, generally in a scoping review, you develop various themes. For example, if it is childhood obesity, you may develop various themes of childhood obesity and then you are discussing the, um, say the review. For example, childhood obesity in um, ethnic populations, like a CLD population, such as culturally and linguistically diverse population versus you have say childhood obesity in a Caucasian population. So you may develop various themes in discussing your scoping review. But again, as I said, it is very broad. It is very generic, just like a narrative review. And the, uh, again, the focus over here is not critiquing the methodology, the rigor behind the study. It is about say summarizing the findings from the original research, which is gathered. All right, so yep, um, I hope uh, this uh, makes sense and it is easy to understand. All right, and then uh, we have systematic review. As I said, this is a very highly systematic and a scientific approach, a very rigorous approach, robust approach. And yes, you're interested in 
um, not just what the study has to say, meaning just summarizing the results, which is what the main focus of narrative and scoping review is, but in a systematic review, you're also very much uh, uh, paying attention to the critique behind the method which is used in generating the results, the quality of the findings, the strength of the findings and the association. So therefore, this is a much more sophisticated and a much more critical approach because you are actually going into the depths of, say, um, fine tuning the articles and um, discussing its nitty gritty. So a lot of critical appraisal involved in systematic review. All right, so this is just a diagrammatic representation of narrative scoping and systematic review. And as you can see in a systematic review, there are a lot more steps involved in generating the evidence and the literature in comparison to narrative or a scoping review. Okay. So um, briefly, these are the key steps um, for undertaking a systematic review. All right, um, and um, Please be mindful that when you take a systematic review in practice, some of these steps could be interchanged, meaning say, for example, step number eight uh, being done first uh, and then say a few steps done later that. So there may be few minor tweaks, but basically a good, a robust systematic review will ensure that they are covering all of these components in undertaking a systematic review. And now you can appreciate hopefully that why is this a very important skill set? Because as you can see, there are say broadly 14 steps involved, but if I had to break this down, it would be say 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. There are many, many sub steps involved when you actually do a systematic review in practice. So yes, it's a very rigorous and a detailed approach and a good systematic review would broadly involve these um, sort of steps, but you may, if you do a systematic review in practice, you will see that there are certain minor tweaks which are unique to your research question, uh, which may not be say in the same chronological order as this one. Okay, but this is covering the most basics of basics of what is involved in a systematic review. All right, so the first step is identifying your research topic. How do you identify your research topic? That is a discussion item between you and your supervisor and your area of interest and research. All right, so I've just taken a hypothetical um, topic and of course I'll be using uh, various examples for various things I explained. So just uh, for instance, if my area of interest is vitamin D. All right, so for instance, um, I would be, uh, my research topic would be to do a systematic review. Um, to examine the association between oral vitamin D supplementation and serum vitamin D levels and birthing outcomes in vitamin D deficient pregnant women. Okay, so now this, the way in which I have written the aim, this is a SMART aim. All right, why is it a SMART aim, S-M-A-R-T, which is specific, uh, measurable, analyzable, time bound, all of that. So, um, it's very difficult for me to teach you how to write SMART aim, aims and objectives because this is more of, say, um, a research um, planning sort of a um, item rather than epidemiology. But um, yes, uh, what I would like to say is that the very basic thing which you should remember in writing a good aim is that your aim covers your independent variable, it covers your dependent variable and it covers your target group, all right? What are your IVs and DVs? Um, I hope you can figure it out. If not, uh, we will be covering that in the coming slides. So that's all right. Okay, so yes, uh, the first thing for you is to do um, understand what are you doing a systematic review on. For instance, when I shared with you that the systematic review which I'm doing in real life is um, looking at uh, vitamin D deficiency and its association with CVD events, all right? And this is going to be a systematic review and a meta-analysis, all right? So similarly, that was my area of interest and a collaborative topic, so I took that up and you may take up something similar depending upon your area of interest. All right, the second thing is to see whether your topic of interest is al already being pursued as a systematic review by anyone else in the world, okay? And how do you see that? You see that through these uh, particular websites, these are the most common ones, there may be others out there, but these are the most common international platforms. So you have the Prospero um, database and then you have the Joanna Brick Institute. Basically on this website, you can search whether your topic of interest has been taken up by somebody else on this planet uh, for a systematic review, all right? And um, the somebody else on this planet may take this topic up, but they have to give a timeline. For example, I aim to complete the systematic review in three years of time. 
and after the three years, if they haven't done a systematic review and haven't completed it, the topic again becomes free for anybody else to take up in the world. All right. So this is um, explaining in very layman colloquial terms, but I hope this makes sense. So yes, these are your um, say uh, regis uh, review registration websites. And what do I mean by registration? We'll be looking that in the coming slides. But the first thing which you do is you're interested in this topic, just see whether it's been done by anybody else because if anybody else is doing it and you doing it doesn't make sense, you're just reinventing the wheel and you won't be getting a lot of credits for that in the research space, all right? So that's why it's important to see whether um, what your area of interest is, is it done by somebody else? If not, good, um, then you can proceed with the topic, all right, through registration. How do you register? We'll look at that in the coming slides. But yes, I hope this makes sense. Then you have step three, where you are developing your research question. You develop your research question, your specific research question using the PICO format. PICO um, stands for uh, Patient Intervention Control and Outcomes. So for instance, the topic which I told you about vitamin D deficiency, for us to break it down into a research question, for us to see whether is this research question or my area of interest meaningful? Can I actually do a systematic review in this? Is it specific enough? This is breaking your uh, area of interest down into this table will help you understand whether your, uh, whether your area of interest is specific enough for you to do a systematic review, all right? So yes, uh, the patient over here uh, refers to, or the population, doesn't have to be patient, refers to pregnant uh, women with vitamin D deficiency. The intervention is um, these uh, women consuming oral vitamin D supplements, and the comparison group is uh, placebo, not consuming the vitamin D supplements. And the outcome over here, I have two outcomes. The first outcome is a vitamin D supplement and its effect on the serum or blood vitamin D levels. And the second one is to see um, the effect of vitamin D supplementation on birthing outcomes. Birthing outcomes are of two types, which is C-section, cesarean section, and then you have the normal vaginal delivery. All right. So basically, um, my question, my area of interest is specific enough. I have clear interventions independent variables. I have clear um, outcome variables. Your intervention is your independent variable, okay? And your outcome is your dependent variable. So yes, I have clear IVs. I have clear DVs. I have a clear target group. So yes, I'm good to go further to the next step. So yep, now um, once your PICO format is ready, then you um, design your specific research question. So over here, I have broken down my research question into three things. One is, the, and those three things are depending upon my outcome variable, all right? So the first one is, uh, is vitamin D supplementation improving blood vitamin D levels? First question. Second, vitamin D supplementation and its uh, impact on C-section delivery, all right? And third, vitamin D supplementation and its impact on normal vaginal birth delivery, all right? So yes, if you can see all of these objectives, they are highly specific and analyzable. I have very clear cut IVs and DVs, and therefore uh, this is a good sign that I'm progressing on the right track to do a systematic review, okay? So this would be your step three, which is developing your um, research question, all right? Then uh, you have to develop your eligibility criteria. Your eligibility criteria includes both your inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is a very, very important step because this gives you further clarity and understanding of what type of articles you're aiming to include in your systematic review, okay? So that's why having clear-cut eligibility criteria is so very much important. So now I have taken a example from one of the other uh, systematic reviews, all right? So I have uh, divided my eligibility criteria into inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Within inclusion criteria, the topic which I have over here is, for instance, now this is a different topic example, which is I want to do, for example, a systematic review on, um, say, um, interventions which are focusing on the management of type 2 diabetes among Pacific Islander population and interventions which are particularly looking at two main components, diet and or physical activity, okay? So over here, my independent variable is intervention, which is diet and or physical activity. My outcome variable is its impact on diabetes management in terms of, say, glycemic control, all right? And my participant population is Pacific Islanders living in Australia, all right? So over here, if you see my inclusion criteria are Pacific Islander population living in Australia, 
And why am I doing a systematic review on that? I need to have a one line rational over here with reference that um, there are um, say maybe no studies then in within the Australian setting, which is looking at Pacific Islander population in Australia and their diabetes management in terms of diet and physical activity. All right. And I'll be having a scientific reference for this. Okay. So that is the rational for me to have this um, inclusion criteria. So basically, what is the take home message from here as much as possible, where relevant and as appropriate, try to have rational for your inclusion ex and exclusion criteria. Then you have adults with type 2 diabetes, but no comorbidities, meaning no other disease condition. Why is this important? Because this may impact HbA1c levels. You know how I said I want to see the impact of interventions on glycemic control or the blood sugar level control. Blood sugar level control is measured via something which is called as HbA1c. All right. So yeah, that's why the rational is uh, that if there are many other disease condition in the individual, the HbA1c level is impacted by all other disease conditions as well. So these individuals, it's okay for them to be type 2 diabetic. They have to be type 2 diabetic because this is what my area of research is. But um, they do not. Um, they should not be having any other comorbidities. So research articles which are focusing on this aspect is what I'll be taking, all right? So research articles which have included participants with um, say um, cardiovascular diseases, dyslipidemia, so on and so forth, I won't be taking those research articles because they do not fit my inclusion criteria. Okay, then articles only in English, then articles from the year 2000 and onwards. Why? Because um, I would be having a rational and a reference for this to show that um, interventions uh, focusing on, uh, say, Pacific Islanders type 2 diabetes management have only been generated or have shown interest um, in the area of research from the year 2000 onward in the last decade. And that's why I'm focusing on research articles from that last decade onwards. All right. Uh, then you have um, interventions looking at, um, yes, only um, interventions which are focusing on diet alone or physical activity alone or a combination of diet and physical activity. If um, original articles have medications included in that, those articles are of, no, of not my interest because my main focus is to see whether diet and physical activity is making a change um, on the blood sugar level of people, which is the HbA1c level of people, okay? Then exclusion criteria, if there are research articles which are doing this lovely intervention on diet and physical activity, but they have included, um, say, non-Pacific Islander population or they are not on Pacific Islander population, those articles are of, of not my interest. Then interventions, as I said, which are other than diet and physical activity like medications, not of my interest. Interventions outside of Australia, okay? Because as I said, my rationale was there is no systematic review done within the Australian setting. Maybe Pacific Islanders who are residing in the United States, a systematic review exists in that space, but not within the Australian setting, all right? Then articles which are um, not in English, um, I will not be considering them because English is the um, only language um, to be used for the review, like um, for in my case. But of course, please to be mindful that um, when there are um, researchers who are uh, bilingual, multilingual, they um, do include research articles of various other languages, although maybe their final systematic review could be in English, but they have the capacity to be reviewing the articles in other languages as well. All right. So yes, this is a hint. If you were to do a systematic review in real life, please look at a few studies on your topic, original articles on your topic or area of interest and look at their inclusion and exclusion criteria, which is written in the method section of the paper. This will give you an idea about what sort of inclusion and exclusion criteria you should be developing for your systematic review, all right? All right, now step five is registering your protocol. So now you're confident that um, your uh, article, um, your area of interest is not um, selected by anybody else on this world um, to be doing a systematic review. You know your inclusion and exclusion criteria, meaning you exactly know on what topic and with what specific details do you want to do a systematic review as per your eligibility criteria. Now you are ready to register your protocol, all right? So basically you have to register your topic. So once you register your topic, then these databases will show that, um, oh, so-and-so person in Australia is doing this topic. So let us not waste time doing this uh, same systematic review, all right? So now you have to register your topic. 
For example, Prospero is a free, um, say, registration database for you to register your topic. They have a template to complete and they complete this template and that is how registration happens. All right, this is just an FYI for you, uh, meaning you're not actually completing a Prospero application or any such thing as part of uh, this, um, say, uh, this um, unit. But it is good for you to know that when you do a systematic review in real life, please be mindful of registering your topic in Prospero or um, any other, say, um, valid registering uh, database such as Joanna Brick Institute, so that nobody else in the world then takes up your topic and publishes the um, systematic review before you do. All right. So I hope this makes sense. Okay, then you have, um, what do you do is the first step which you do now is you have registered your topic, the topic is yours, you know what type of articles uh, you are gathering from your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now the time has come that you start um, searching for uh, relevant articles to be included in your systematic review, original articles to be included in your systematic review. Generally, 99% of the time, gray literature is not included in systematic review. It has to be peer reviewed, published research articles. All right. So um, how do you, um, so basically, how do you search for articles? I'll be showing you that in the coming slides. But please note now there is this another software you learned about the Prospero database. Now understand that there is another software which is called as Covidence um, software. This Covidence software, it helps you with your article screening process. So um, briefly, how you do article screening that has been mentioned to you in your earlier tutorial. All right, but yes, Covidence software, it helps you to do article screening uh, in a blinded manner. What do I mean by blinded manner? Generally and ideally a systematic review is done by two individuals. So these two individuals are searching for articles independently. They do not know, um, individual A does not know which articles individual B has selected for the systematic review and vice versa. This is called as the blinded process, all right? So in the COVID software, if I'm individual A, I get to put down my articles but in such a manner that um, individual B cannot see which articles am I gathering for the systematic review. Similarly, um, the articles which are put in the COVID software by individual B, I cannot see what articles he or she is putting in. All right. So this is a blinded process. The COVID help you to helps you to do this blinded process of systematic review. All right. And uh, yes. Um, covid uh, so first thing it helps you, you to do is a blinded systematic review search of articles. Then second, it helps in the screening of articles by article title and abstract screening. All right, how do you do article title abstract screening? Roughly, um, this has been covered um, for you in your earlier tutorials. The same thing is applied, same thing is applied in practice even over here. But basically over here, you just open the article in the covid in um, say software and you are screening the article by reading the abstract and then the full text, all right? Uh, so yes, full text screening, I have already written that. So yes, uh, Covidence, uh, as I said, um, Covidence is a paid tool, meaning it is available free of cost via University of Canberra. Um, and um, if you have one colleague on the team who is affiliated to University of Canberra, other colleagues which are not affiliated to University of Canberra can also join in your COVID account and they can help you with the screening process. So if I am in Australia and if my colleague B is in some other part of the world and we want to do the article screening process via COVID, um, I can give her access invitation to the COVID account and she can join in the same platform. All right. So yes, uh, one person has to be affiliated to the institute which has access to COVID and others can join in because of your privilege, all right? And do remember there is another free software which is called as Ryan and Ryan is available free of cost, all right? So basically um, this is accessible by anybody everywhere, all of that. So no issue with it being a paid version and stuff like that, all right? So, but yes, in University of Canberra, we are using COVID because it is available. But if uh, that is not an option for you, you can always opt for Ryan, all right? Okay, so this is just to show you, this is how the COVID um, account looks. Um, so when you open COVID, this is a screenshot, this is how it looks. So then as you can see, you have, uh, first is just importing references stage, which is just importing full text. Then you are screening the article for its abstract. Then the second stage is full text screening. 
and all of this is then blinded independent by two reviewers and then if there are any conflicts meaning if reviewer a has said myself that article 2 4 and 7 should be included in the systematic review but you say no article uh, 2 4 should not be included 7 is fine but if you say article 2 and 4 should not be included then a third person can come in a senior researcher and can resolve these conflicts all right so this is what coherence helps you to do and it helps you to document all of this thing in a formal manner also remember you will be learning in the coming slides it helps you to generate a prisma flowchart what is that we'll look at that in the coming slides but I hope you can now have an understanding and an appreciation of what is Covidence. It is used for article screening. It is used for the title and abstract screening. And it is also used for full text screening. And you can have uh, more than one person use Covidence um, with the same account. All right, you can invite, um, say, um, users who are not affiliated to University of Canberra to review your Covidence as well. Okay, so it is used by multiple people. It helps with the blinded um, article screening process. So lots of advantages, all right? Okay, then you have, um, as I said, the article title and abstract screening. How do you do quick article screening? This has been covered earlier um, in your uh, lectures and tutorial. Um, so predominantly tutorial, but yes. Uh, so the first thing which you do in an article screening process is you search for article on scientific databases. Um, second is find the full text of the article. Um, third um, is um, where to find and how to find relevant articles is by generating appropriate keywords. And fourth is you add all of these full text references to your covidence and which helps you to do the article screening process. Okay. So this is just to break down 7.A, 7.B, things like that. All right, sorry. Um, so yes, so the first step, as I said, is searching articles on scientific databases. So for instance, these are all of the scientific databases. There are many, many more out there and which are more relevant to your field. But for example, um, for me, who is a nutrition researcher, the main databases which I use is Web of Science, Science Direct, um, EBSCO host, um, Google's um, Scholar, and PubMed um, as well, yeah. So basically these are the uh, databases which I use in nutrition research. You may have many others and which is totally fine as long as they are scientific, which is good. Best practice, search for articles on more than one database. At least use uh, three to four database or two to three databases a minimum because there are databases, they um, are subscribed to various journals. Um, and if that database is not subscribed to a particular journal, you will miss out on articles which are relevant, which are published in those journals. So always good to search on multiple databases, all right? And whatever I have said, I have just written it over here in this box. So this box is adding nothing new uh, rather than what I have already said, okay? All right, then how? once you know that these articles are of your interest, the abstract looks really useful for your research topic, then you have to search for full text of these articles. How do you search for full text of the article? Uh, some of the articles are available free of cost, open access, full text, just via the database. Many are not. And University of Canberra, you can go on this portal and you can search for articles via University of Canberra uh, website. And then you will get a lot of articles which are uh, essentially paid, but they are free of cost because University of Canberra has subscribed to those databases and journals. Okay. Uh, then if those articles are not available via University of Canberra, then uh, you can request the article from the University of Canberra library and they can get the full text for you free of cost, all right? And sometimes this also works. For instance, I have a um, friend um, who is um, say studying at uh, the Arizona um, State University, ASU in um, United States. And if I don't get certain articles and it is very challenging and if UC for some reason is taking time or some other technical conflict, I ask her and she flicks me the article. Her database at her university is much more big. They have much more subscription to other journals. So that benefits um, for me to get the article if I needed ASAP for some urgency, all right? Otherwise, University of Canberra is really pretty good and they would be getting you your full text articles in no time, all right? So it's very efficient. But in case if there is any technical error, you are stuck up, then you can request friends in other, um, say, academic institutes um, 
and renowned um, say institutions such as say big tertiary hospitals they also have access to databases in supporting you in getting a couple of articles okay full text all right so um yep um, and if you have any doubts in uh, say how to go on the uc links which i have provided and how to search for full text please ask the librarian at uc because in uc you have a research librarian who's particularly supporting students in understanding how do you search for full text how do you make good keywords how do you search in databases and all of that stuff so all of these steps are actually covered and given good guidance by the uc research librarian so if you are in doubt and you are doing a systematic review in practice please visit the library or the research librarian in your faculty and they will give you further information okay all right so keywords uh, where to find a uh, keywords so as i said to get relevant articles you have to punch in keywords in the database so for example if my area of research is um, childhood obesity and the sugary drinks meaning beverages like uh, say um, soft drinks and things like that my key, my one of my key we, keyword is childhood obesity and sugar sweetened beverages all right but there are many other places where you can search for relevant keywords the more relevant your keywords are um the more prob probability you have of getting all of your articles of your interest and not missing out on um, others so where do i find my keywords i find my keywords in the title of the article so over here i also find my keywords from the keywords which have been generated by the original article itself all right so a lot of time keywords are part of the publication and it is easier for you to get these keywords if not um then there are a few other places which i'll share with you but yes the main place is title um the other places say keywords which are generated by the article itself um then um the other place um which i find keyword i think it is in the coming slide is the last paragraph of the introduction this is something which i shared with you in the earlier lecture or tutorial so in the last paragraph of the um introduction where the aims are written or where the objectives are written that is where again you can have good keywords being generated all right so um yep so that is say um other spaces of finding relevant keywords all right so yep i have written over here so the aims and objective section of the paper which is generally the last paragraph of the introduction that is where again you will find more relevant keywords um in your area of interest and research okay so yep so that is what's written over here then the other way of finding relevant keywords are generating synonyms so like for childhood obesity the synonym which you have is obese and just obesity or um, say overweight or adiposity weight status these are all of the synonyms for say um, obesity or childhood obesity okay as you can see over here these other examples i have given you is out of my phd thesis uh, because my current area of research is say looking into behavioral a uh, practices of child feeding and how this is affiliated with overnutrition and undernutrition all right so this is from my um, research area of how to generate keywords okay so yes synonyms helps you to find relevant articles as well a uh, very useful practice so yes this is what i have written is what i have explained then you have permutations and combinations so for instance um, as i said i don't want articles randomly on childhood obesity i want articles which are looking at childhood obesity and sugary beverages so then i have to add a conjunction and uh, make it into a compound sentence per se but don't um, add a big sentence in your database you can say childhood obesity the conjunction over here is and uh, sugar sweetened beverages okay or else you can say childhood obesity or weight status and sugar sweetened beverages okay so that is how your other conjunction and not could be for example this is what i found a lot in my phd thesis when i was doing so i had to add a not for child feeding practices not breastfeeding because um, most of the database used to assume when i talk about child feeding practices i want articles um, related to breastfeeding no for me it was child feeding practices when the child has already started eating okay so that is how i added the not so permutations and combinations help you to search for more relevant and appropriate articles okay all right so um yeah i've written the same thing for you then the last tip is truncations truncations also help you to search for relevant articles so for example if you add a little truncation the star mark after obesity it will um gather all the articles which are related to obesity so obese 
overweight, weight status, all of these sort of um, keywords will be gathered in this one truncation, all right? Um, the other thing, FYI, which helps you to generate, a, say, or find a similar and relevant article, and I have just given the example of Google Scholar. So if I click on cited by and related article, this helps me to, this takes me to articles which are very similar to my area of interest. And from those, maybe two or three articles could be um, of use as well, all right? Um, so yes, and this um, say um, cited by and related articles, this um, is there in all of the databases in various portals in Google Scholar, this is how it looks just as an FYI, all right? And Google Scholar anyways is a good place to start when you are very, very new in research, you have no idea about what databases are and you just want to start and get comfortable and be confident in something, start with Google Scholar. It is very easy to use, very self-intuitive. Once you're confident with Google Scholar, then go and explore other databases relevant to your area of research. All right, so um, yes, sometimes a specific type helps. So for instance, if I um, put um, say PDF, and then if I add childhood obesity and sugar sweetened beverages, it gives me directly um, say full text articles, which are available on Google Scholar directly, okay? It is not always possible because as I said, a lot of articles are locked and you will have to go via university database. But um, just to let you know that by adding PDF, et cetera, sometimes you do get full text that way, all right? And also look for, um, say, academic platforms such as ResearchGate. For example, a I get a lot of requests on ResearchGate by various um, um, researchers across the globe um, where I can put my full text on ResearchGate. And if it is, say, um, for example, what do I mean? If it is not publicly available, if it is a paid article, I don't advertise it on ResearchGate, meaning the full text of it, but I let people know that this is my article which is published. And if people are interested, they tell me um, on ResearchGate, just with a click of button, please provide me with the full text and I can personally provide someone with the full text. That is not unofficial, that is not not legal. Okay, it is a very, very legal thing to do that um, you as a original author, um, of the manuscript, which is published, you can provide personally your uh, full text article to somebody else who has requested another researcher. What is not legal is if your article is um, costing money by the journal, you cannot just simply put the full text upon some other um, say platform. That is not acceptable, all right? Okay, so um, I hope this is um, understandable and it makes sense. Okay, so this is how on ResearchGate, etc. if you find an article of interest and if the researcher has put it up on say ResearchGate, you can request full text to the researcher from that platform. Also, a lot of times if you email the corresponding author, they will give you full text. So sometimes I get, uh, most of the time I get requests on ResearchGate because I have my articles available over there. But on in the other times, I have um, people emailing me, researchers emailing me and asking me for full text. And yes, I'm very happy to provide them with my full text, okay? All right, so yep, um, all of this I have explained to you. So yes, once you have the full text of your articles, which you are uh, confident that this is, uh, these are in my area of interest, then you add it on to EndNote and from EndNote, you can take it to your covariance. It's good to have a copy in EndNote because that will help you when you're writing your systematic review and yes, um, on covariance, you have to add your full text because it, it will help you with article screening and full text screening processes in covariance. Okay, um, again, please note University of Canberra has free EndNote workshops available. Um, if uh, this link is not taking you to the right direction, please go to the library and ask when do they have the next EndNote workshops? It is very important for you to know how to learn EndNote because that is used um, very widely in the area of research. Okay, um, so yes, EndNote is where you add your references. It does the reference automatic for you. APA system, Harvard system, Vancouver system. EndNote does all of those uh, referencing style for you. So you don't waste time adding commas and semicolons and full stops. All of that referencing is done for you. Okay, it also helps you with in-text referencing when you're writing your systematic review and you have to put your reference number 145. You don't have to manually do it you can actually add in the reference in that manner via EndNote, okay? So that is why I say add your references in EndNote and add your references in Covidence 
and EndNote free workshops are available in UC. Go to the library and ask for further details or email them, whatever is convenient for you. And EndNote is uh, download, uh, you can download it from UC platform and the EndNote is there for life, okay, which is amazing. So even if in the future you're not a UC student, you have graduated, the EndNote on your um, personal laptop, et cetera, will stay with you for life, okay? Um, yep, yeah, so all of this is what I have said. Then full text screening. So yes, the full text screening, as I said, it is uh, again done blinded by two researchers in Covidence. Um, and what uh, and what I do with my full text screening, I keep my inclusion exclusion criteria in front of me. I keep my PICO format research questions in front of me and my objectives. And then I see whether in this space is the um, full text article fitting or not. Okay, so that helps me with the confirmation whether I am in the right direction. Because sometimes when you're reading so many articles, you may lose track. For you not to lose track, um, one of the best practice which I do is have inclusion exclusion criteria in front of me have the research questions and objectives in front of me, and then um, re start reviewing the article for full text. Does the full text make sense? Is it meaningful to add it in the systematic review? Okay, so yes, as I said, if there is any discrepancy between the two researchers, uh, basically you say these 20 articles should be included. Um, the researcher B says, um, no, these um, say 30 articles should be included. So 10 of, uh, you have a discrepancy for 10 articles. This can be resolved by the third party senior researcher. Okay. All right. So, as I said, Covidence generates this Prisma flowchart for you. What is a Prisma flowchart? Basically, a Prisma flowchart tells you how many articles are included in your systematic review, how many are not included, and why are they not included? Because of, say, specific inclusion exclusion reasons. Okay. But basically, it essentially it summarizes the number of studies which are included versus not included in your systematic review. Okay, so this is a completed version of it. As you can see, it will tell you, these are the databases you search, which is of what is of most important, the heart of Prisma is telling you, these many studies are included, all right? And this is what these studies mean. Eight are included for this therapy, three for this therapy, 10 for this therapy, whatever the research question is over here. But it will clearly tell you, so many articles are not ex, um, not included, they are excluded for so-and-so reason, and so many articles are included finally in your final count, your final number, okay? So this is a good summarization of um, articles included versus excluded in your study, all right? So um, that's why Prisma flowchart um, is uh, very, very strongly encouraged, and it is part of 99.999% of systematic reviews. It would be very odd to do a systematic review and not have a Prisma flowchart. All right. Okay, so you know how I said that a systematic review may have a small little statistics involved. This is the small little statistics. This is called as the inter-rater agreement, which is done by a Cohen-Kappa test. Okay, so the statistical test, which is done is Cohen-Kappa. What does Cohen-Kappa does? It does the inter-rater agreement. What is inter-rater agreement? For instance, it tells you these are the number of articles which you agree on. These are the number of articles which the other researcher disagrees on, all right? And um, these are the number of articles both of you agree on, and these are the number of articles which both of you disagree to include, okay? So you have a two by two table, essentially. You put these numbers, the number of articles you agree, disagree, mutually and not mutually, in one of these um, Cohen Kappa calculators. It is very, very simple and straightforward, okay? You punch in those numbers of agreement and disagreement in this calculator, and then it clearly um, tells you the um, number of agreements. So 83.3% of agreement, which is called as moderate agreement. In one of these two calculators, you also have a reference for cutoff, meaning if you have an agreement of 50%, is this good, bad, or ugly? If you have an agreement of 90%, is this good, bad, or um, worst? All right? So yes, uh, this is what um, it generates for you, um, a two by two table. Both of you agree to include these articles. Both of you agree to exclude these articles. Only you um, want to include this number of articles and the other one wants to include this number of articles. And then you press compute and voila, you have your Cohen Kappa agreement done for you. And uh, with the cutoff provided, whether this is good, bad or whatever, all right? So as I said, a very minor statistic is involved in systematic review, not a lot of papers report Cohen Kappa agreement, but the more recent papers done in a rigorous manner, they make sure to include Cohen-Kappa's agreement, okay? 
All right. So then uh, this is uh, the other things. As I said, systematic review is a very rigorous process. It's a very robust process. And the heart of systematic review lies in critiquing the original articles which you have included, which is not done so much in a scoping or a narrative review. They are mostly just summarizing findings of research papers. Here you are critiquing them for their methodology processes, for their um, statistical analysis done, for the kind of references they have used, so on and so forth, many things, okay? Um, so there are various types of quality criteria assessment tools. The one which is widely used in the area of nutrition is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic Quality Criteria Checklist. You will have your own quality criteria assessment tool in your area of research, um, physiotherapy, occupational nursing, so on and so forth. If you don't know what is the tool which you use in your area of research, it is best to ask your senior researchers or your professors in your area okay, um, of research. All right, but yes, for nutrition students, this is a tool which we use. So the information is here in for you. Okay, so um, for example, uh, a quality criteria checklist is a checklist like this. This is the American Dietetic Association checklist. Okay, this is for the nutrition space. This is what the checklist looks like. So basically, this is the full text article which I have. So every article that I include in my systematic review, you have to do a quality criteria checklist for every single article, okay? You have to tell whether the quality is good, whether the quality is not good, or it is not clear, or in some cases where uh, this, um, say, variable or this aspect is not applicable, okay? So yes, you review the quality of the, um, say, research in terms of the methodology strategy, which is used in terms of the statistical um, analysis, which is used in terms of the definition and the measurement of IV and DV, which is done, the results, how they are reported, um, um, if the discussion is done properly with acknowledging appropriate limitations and strengths, so on and so forth. All right. So basically, you are critiquing the articles on various facets of the research paper. All right right from the literature review, the background introduction of the method paper to the methodology, to the results and to the discussion, okay? And then finally, you rate the quality of the, um, um, say the research paper after all of this say marking. And this I have rated all as yes is because this article was really good. It was a meta-analysis of randomized control trial. So what does this say? This is the cream quality level one evidence, all right? So the way in which the article was written was absolutely fantastic. There were like, there was hardly anything which I could critique on. So therefore the article received a um, positive sign. So a positive sign meaning this article is a good quality article, all right? It does not mean that if an article is bad quality article, you remove it out of your systematic review, no. You are just showing your scholarship, your intellectual contribution by critiquing the article telling the um, reviewers or the person who's reading your paper that, yes, there are so many studies done in this space, but as you can see, 80% of the article are just crappy articles. They haven't been done with a good robustness and um, say rigor. And you just have 20% of articles which have been done very, very well. Therefore, the evidence which can be, or the conclusion which can be made out of this finding should be made with caution because they haven't used the best methods of critiquing and research. Does that make sense? Okay, so I hope this is clear. As I said, this will differ um, depending upon your area of uh, faculty and what you're studying. So best to ask your supervisor uh, which quality criteria tool you should be using. All right. Uh, now also be mindful, there are other tools which combine bias assessment with quality criteria checklist. Okay, so they may be a amalgamation of both. If they are amalgamation of both where they are checking for bias and they are checking for quality, then you do not have to do a separate quality criteria and separate bias assessment. You just have to do the one, okay? Which is most relevant in your field. That is something you have to ask your supervisor. But over here, I have listed for you a lot of websites and even in the footnotes of various tools which are available for bias assessment. And bias assessment is particularly done for the study designing uh, and the methodology which is used. I'll show you one of the tool which is done for randomized control trial. Uh, but yes, which is most relevant to you, please ask your supervisor. I cannot give you one gold standard for this because this differs from discipline to discipline. All right, so let me just show you this tool now. Okay, I'm sharing this PDF with you. Um, let me confirm. Yes, I'm sharing it with you and I'm sure you can see it at your end as well. 
So this is the Crokin risk of bias assessment for randomized controlled trials, okay? So if I'm doing a systematic review and a meta-analysis on randomized controlled trials, then I'll be using this tool, okay? So it looks out for selection bias, it looks out for reporting bias, any other biases, it look out, looks out for performance bias, detection bias, and attrition bias, all right? So it is, um, say, uh, critiquing the article on all of these biases. So what I do as a best practice um, to do a very comprehensive systematic review, I do a bias assessment, and then I do a quality criteria, American Dietetic Association quality criteria checklist. Depending if my research topic demands both, I do both of this thing. I do quality criteria checklist using the ADA tool, American Dietetic Association, and I do bias assessment using the relevant tool for the appropriate study design. Okay, so the bias assessment tool is um, determined based on the study design you are selecting for your systematic review. If you're looking at all prospective studies or all RCTs or a mixture of prospective and quasi-experimental design, depending upon the type of study design, original articles that you're including in your systematic review, your bias assessment tool will be determined in that manner, okay? So yes, uh, where appropriate, I do both the things, quality criteria checklist and I do the bias assessment tool. There are certain cases in which both of these are not applicable and I have found this one good tool which is doing both of the cases together, then I just go for that. For example, for prospective cohort study, I am currently using the, um, it is called as, um, Otava um, ONS, it is called as Otava um, Bias Assessment Tool. I don't completely remember the name right now, but it is for a um, prospective cohort study. And uh, this tool, it does bias assessment and it does quality criteria checklist for me for prospective cohort studies. And my systematic review, which is vitamin D and the CVD outcomes, it is only on prospective cohort studies. So that is the best tool for me because it is combining both of the things in one, which is bias assessment and quality criteria. Okay, so I hope this is meaningful students and this is giving you a broad overview and understanding of how you need to do a systematic review and a meta-analysis. Sorry, um, I don't know why my nose is so itchy today. I just, I feel like, yeah, scratching my nose for some reason. No, I don't have COVID, okay? But yeah, I just have a scratchy nose today for some reason. But um, yeah, coming back to um, systematic reviews and leaving my nose out of it. Okay, so um, yes, I hope this makes sense that um, you have a quality criteria checklist, you have bias assessment tools, bias assessment tools are based upon the study design. And there are, in some cases, you may have this one wonderful tool which does quality criteria and bias assessment for you all in one. Uh, which is in my case for the vitamin D paper and I have just using that one tool. So all of this is uh, best to be discussed um, in association with your supervisor who's supervising you for your research project. Okay. All right. So yes, then what do you do? Once you have decided these are the 50 studies or 83 studies or 10 studies, whatever it is, these are the number of studies which I have in, I will be including in my systematic review. Then you start summarizing your studies. Okay, you summarizing you start summarizing your studies um, using the studies st summary template. So the one which um, you are doing as a formative assessment, which I have discussed very early on in the um, start of the semester. So yes, um, that is the sort of study summary template you use to summarize the 10 articles or the 11 articles which are including in your systematic reviews, okay? Um, so there are some topics which are so unique that you may only have say um, five or six or 10 articles done in that space. And there are some topics, topics which are so extensive. For instance, um, the vitamin D paper which I'm doing, we have a total of approximately 123 articles, okay, yes. And we are using this sort of template to summarize these research articles, all right? So yes, then you have to summarize the research articles using your study summary template. One of the study summary template you are completing as a formative assessment, all right? But there are other summary study sub template as well. One which is um, provided by the NHMRC study summary template. You can just Google up NHMRC study summary template and you can use that. 
or else you can use a study summary template which is more relevant to your field which your supervisor has suggested so these tools which you use they all depend upon um, say the type of research topic you are doing but a very generic study summary template is the one which i have designed for you as part of your formative assessment okay it's a very simple one which is applicable to almost all fields of research okay almost all i'm not saying to every but almost all it can be used all right so yes step 12 involves you summarizing all of your original articles in a study summary template which you are including as part of a systematic review okay then the last thing is you complete a prisma checklist okay so basically this is a checklist for you to see whether you have included all of these details in the writing of a systematic review all right this is very very important um students why because this helps you to ensure that you have not missed out one of the other steps okay so for instance when i do all of my um, step 1 to step 12 then i look at this and then i see which steps have i completed and which are the other steps which will come in my writing so this helps me to refresh that these are the things which i have to be mindful of when i start writing my systematic review in a word document okay so yes this checklist therefore is so important all right and this is just another fyi there are many many other checklists okay just like the prisma checklist there are many other checklists and depending upon your area of research you may choose one or the other um to monitor how you are writing what you are writing if you have included all the components which are relevant in your systematic review all right so yes the final step is then to write your manuscript okay so um as you can appreciate there are so many steps before you actually start writing a systematic review step 1 to 13 then you finally start writing your manuscript and it is very difficult um students to um tell you how to write your systematic review because that is a workshop in itself i'll have to do a one week workshop if i have to teach you how exactly do you write a systematic review and as you will appreciate a lot of students do a systematic review as part of their research project or research planning or a honors project so this is not done in one lecture this is not a one lecture cup of tea okay but the kind of things which you will be thinking about uh, briefly when you are writing a systematic review is you will be thinking about the direction of the um, effect all right so positively negatively associated the um size of the effect strong association weak association um is the effect consistent across all studies 9 out of 10 studies are saying this association is significant what is the strength of the evidence now the strength of the evidence comes through various things it comes through the effect size yes you know the concept of effect size now um that uh, the quality of the study how it is done is a good methodological procedure used have they accounted for the biases Uh, which they may be facing have they minimized their chances of type 1 and type 2 error all right so all of this will determine um how you write and critique a system uh, the original articles which you have included in your systematic review so yes this is a very very detailed process so uh, in a systematic review again be mindful you will have the narrative part where you are say writing down the results and then lot of researchers now they complement their systematic review with a meta analysis doing a meta analysis is not compulsory when you do a systematic review but now more and more researchers are complementing their appropriate or relevant work with meta analysis because it just makes your work much more stronger because you are not just narratively describing the findings and saying that yes um i can see 9 of the 10 studies have reported a strong association between vitamin um, d deficiency and mortality no you are um supporting this with quantitative findings all right okay which is your um, say your statistical analysis your meta analysis so this is just a brief fyi students i cannot teach you two things as scope of this some um, say uh, epidemiology unit i would have to take an advanced epidemiology course which is part 2 of this current course where i teach you how to write a systematic review and i teach you um, biostatistical techniques such as how to do a meta analysis and so on and so forth okay so uh, please be mindful i cannot cover that uh, but this is just a brief snapshot this is one of the um, say this is called as a forest plot this is a very very popular uh, statistical uh, analytical graphical technique which is used when undertaking a meta analysis um the dash line over your fyi is a line of significance clinical significance we are not just talking about statistical significance we are saying to reach clinical significance to for this result to have a clinical real life impact 
this is the say uh, effect size it needs okay so this dashed line over here is a line of um, clinical significance okay so you want uh, the more the these individual studies are closer to these line of significance the better it is okay and if you see nelson 2012 over here all right and you have in this blue which i have said um the weight of nelson 2012 is 41.38% okay which means it is explaining the maximum amount of variance in the outcome variable so this um study is a meta analysis which i have done for my um phd student okay and uh, for this paper what i have done is to see whether low carbohydrate diet and very low carbohydrate diet if they are useful in say improving an individual's glycemic index or their blood sugar levels or their hba1c levels okay so this nelson et al study have shown that in his study consuming low carbohydrate diet has the maximum impact in uh, say reducing your blood sugar levels okay so high blood sugar levels reducing that in diabetic individuals type 1 diabetic individuals okay so this, this study has explained the maximum variance in your outcome variable which is your hba1c level this has the strongest effect size 41.38 all right and it has very very narrow confidence interval this is what i taught earlier um smaller the horizontal line better it is because you have narrow confidence interval narrow confidence interval meaning less dispersion less dispersion meaning stronger the effect size more generalizable are the findings okay and this um, box becoming bigger it just shows the say strength of the association which it is um, say measuring and um, supporting so this is the overall effect size over here in red over here circled in red so basically what is it telling you that the closer the numbers are odds ratios are to this red color effect size the better are your results okay but yes if you want to see this gives you the individual weightage so the maximum variance in your hba1c is explained by nelson this has the maximum um say the maximum impact is of this study all right okay so i hope this is helpful but as uh, please be rest assured um you are not undertaking a meta analysis as part of this um, course but it is good for you to understand the basics of it all right so yes a meta analysis a uh, most commonly now the uh, best practice is where relevant to do a meta analysis with a systematic review if it is not possible you can still publish a systematic review as it is okay all right so um yes that's it all right i was just making sure whether i have covered everything yes i have all right so yes that's it um students and i'll see you in your uh, next lecture and dude thank you thank you for your time